part of science is actually nomadic. So he coins the terms, or they coin the terms, because this appears in, 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 in Deleuze and Gattari's work, royal science versus nomad science or minor science. Let's, let's keep the terms royal versus nomad, or they use also major science and minor science, royal science and nomad science. Royal science is the science of the great royal societies. You know, the Royal Society of London, the Royal Academy of Paris. There is a science that is already organized around a particular institution and an institution that is supposed to speak to the, to, to, to the government, in that case to an aristocratic government. An institution that is supposed to be at the service of government and wants to get its legitimacy from that service. And that, of course, polices its own borders to make sure that everything is kosher and therefore has very well-defined borders, has a very well-defined territory. Versus nomad science, which is a science practiced in minor fields, fields that don't have much prestige, which is much more able to follow the horses, so to speak. That is, to follow nature where it leads and therefore injects divergence into the, the history of different scientific fields. That distinction, which we could make simply by talking about royal science and, and nomad science, is much easier to make once we begin to think in terms of populations of scientific fields. Because then you can find, you can distinguish in that population those that are aiming towards convergence versus those that are pushing the entire enterprise into farther and farther divergence. As I said, the data, because there is data as to how many, you know, how many different fields exist every decade, shows that science is diverging. That is, that the number of scientific fields is increasing. Not only because new subjects are discovered, like genetics, when the genes were discovered, but because between every two existing fields, like between physics and chemistry, there tend to be born other scientific fields, like physical chemistry, or between chemistry and biology, biochemistry, or between biology and physics, you know, uh, biophysics. Biophysics, biochemistry, physical chemistry are separate fields, with their own, you know, in many cases, with their own departments in universities, with their own traditions, with their own culture, with their own jargon, and, and just keep adding larger, and you just keep making the number of fields in the population become larger and larger, giving you the impression, of course, that science is not conversion on a final truth, but like the nomads of the steps, tracking reality, or tracking truth, if you want to, one oasis at a time, one singularity at a time, instead of occupying a space that has already been divided and subdivided and it's well defined and we are just waiting just for the final truth to be added there, it's complete don't even move it, don't even touch it that is the final truth about reality now as I said, the data supports the loops at the beginning this began as a kind of I wish we could conceptualize you know, scientific fields this way but once you begin checking the actual data in the history of science that is the way it is <coughs> Now, before I move on to, to talk a little bit more about royal science and nomad science, then we first need to get out of the way a particular nuisance, a particular uh, annoying presence, which is, of course, the presence of idealists. You know, I've been, I've been dumping on idealists from class number one, right? I said, in this class, at least for these three days, you know, we are all materialists. I'm not saying that I already convinced you of that, but I'm, I'm saying that I, I hope I convince you to play ball with me for these three days. You can you go, go, back, go back to whatever ontological position you have tomorrow. For these three days, we are all supposed to believe that there is a world that exists independently of our minds. But whatever treaty and whatever you know, uh, uh, impermanent truths we, we, can, we, we can manage to have here, the, the reality out there is that the majority of humanities fields that deals with science are idealists. They are not materialists. And so they are in the business of debunking science. Debunking science because if there is no material world 
and really they're all there is is appearances and phenomena structured by language, then all, everything that science says, the existence of oxygen, the existence of carbon, the existence of solar systems, the existence of nebulas, has to be false, or at least has to be just another signifier, which is just as valid as the devil, as God, as cherubs, and archangels, and, 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 and so on. It's just another myth. And no one would have believed that something like this could happen, but it has happened. The field is called science studies, and it right now has its own departments in many universities in the United States, in many universities in England. They have respect, they have prestige, they have money. And they are putting out an enormous number of new students out every year, all of them convinced that they are going to be debunking the objectivity of the, of the, of the uh, uh, knowledge that scientific fields have produced in the last 400 years. They also have superstars, like Bruno Latour. Now they jump, as usual, because that is what idealists do, from one fad to the next fad. You know, once the construction, at some point the construction is hot, so everybody's deconstructing, you know, everybody's going to the meta level to be uh, doing a critique of the object level, then the construction it stops being fashionable, they move into the next thing, and they move into the next thing. Science studies is no different. In the 1960s, phenomenology and ling linguistic phenomenology was very influential in sociology and created a particular um, uh, uh, field of sociology called social constructivism. Social constructivism is simply based on the idea that we structured idea and we structured the world with signifiers. Since signifiers are arbitrary, that is, they are conventional, they are all stereotypes, so we're basically we structure our experience with social constructions, with social conventions. And the social science, the science studies field jumped directly into that, into that, that bandwagon. Uh, the Bruno Latour and, and Woolbar, his, his one-time collaborator, published a book called Laboratory, uh, what is it? Laboratory Life, I believe, subtitled The Social Construction of Scientific Facts, which was a major hit in the humanities. The humanities, of course, always being a little jealous of the budgets and the prestige that the scientific <coughs> fields have in their universities, Oh my God, if every laboratory fact is socially constructed, well, it means that we are the ones who can tell scientists what they are doing, because we know about social construction, we know about signifiers, we know about stereotypes, and so we can tell them what they have been doing all along. Of course, Bruno Latour did not prove that every, every field or every fact of uh, proved in a laboratory was so, a social construction, and he was so embarrassed later on of having jumped into that fashion that the second edition of the book was simply called The Construction of Laboratory Facts, which to me was a dead giveaway. You know, that's when the rats start leaving the, 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 uh, the sinking ship. You know when the rats <laughs> start leaving the ship, the ship is sinking. Nevertheless, this field has flourished. And in the majority of its cases, it's trying to demonstrate that the actual cognitive content of different scientific fields is simply a social construction. It's simply a, construct a construction done by who won a particular controversy at any one particular time. It's, it's won by alliances between scientists, it's won by alliances between scientific institutions and non-scientific institutions, is won by the application or lack of application of certain scientific ideas to technology, and there's nothing more to the content of scientific knowledge than this social construction. Feminists also jumped into the bandwagon, thanks to the work of Luce de Rigore. And before that, uh, others like, uh, what's her name, Sandra, well, I'll come back to her name in a second, Luce de Rigore, has come up with the idea that from the very real fact that women were excluded from scientific institutions and from scientific practice for a long time, at least up to Madame Curie, Madame Curie is perhaps the first one who does brilliant discoveries that are as brilliant as anything that males have ever done, uh, there had been a few women.